Viewers can get pretty confused by a film like One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest. Did Max Revolution actually make a difference? What was Chief trying to accomplish? Does Nurse Ratched represent women in the 1960s? Here's some insight into the ending of the classic film. Billy Bibbit is a soft-spoken young man with thoughts of killing himself, but he doesn't choose to end his life all on his own. Nurse Ratched talks him into it. When Mac throws a party on the ward with two sex workers, he encourages Billy to make his move on Candy, in whom he'd expressed interest during the boat trip. You come, God, 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 you, I've got you beautiful hair. Candy, who's likely used to her clients treating her badly, seems genuinely flattered when Billy stutters out his compliments. Their excursion in the supply closet is clearly more than just a meaningless fling. That doesn't matter to Nurse Ratchet. Ratchet knows precisely what she's doing when she eviscerates the self-confidence that Mac has been trying to bolster in the young man, making him feel shame for his actions. Instead of addressing the situation in a healthier, helpful way, she threatens to tell his mom, and the dam holding back Billy's self-loathing breaks. As someone who likes to get a rise out of her patients during therapy, Ratchet delights in setting off the conditions that landed him in the hospital to begin with. While her goal may not have been for Billy to die, she knows her manipulation will finally set Mac off and allow her to regain control over the war. Billy's death is acceptable collateral damage for Ratchet if she can get what she wants, a reason to lobotomize McMurphy and to use Billy as an example of what happens when you rebel. Every time someone has an intimate interaction in the film, the characters in Cuckoo's Nest get punished, whether it's on the ship when Mac goes below deck with candy and the patients panic and almost crash the boat, or the way Ratchet gets manipulative and hostile anytime someone discusses lovemaking during group. Billy's punishment is death when he loses his virginity to candy. This is an outdated TV and film trope that is especially prevalent during periods when society frowns hardest upon expressions of libido. In 1963, when the film is set, the hippie movement was just beginning, and it continued through 1975 when the film debuted. Along with the idea of peace and making strides to end the Vietnam War, embracing free love was a huge aspect of the movement, which was one reason some other parts of society shunned the hippie lifestyle. Characters like Ratchet, who are completely unwilling to embrace change, represent the idea that promiscuity is a punishable sin. In short, Ratchet wins and Mac loses. Chief represents the one small victory of McMurphy's attempt to liven the ward, but everyone else falls right back in line with the status quo. No one fights back, and Ratchet uses electroshock therapy and lobotomies as weapons rather than cures. Seafeld says after Mac has been missing for a while, McMurphy has escaped. They were taking him through the tunnel. He beat up two of the attendants and escaped. It's easier for the patients to delude themselves into thinking that Mac escaped so they can continue to revere him as a legend. It's comforting that escape is possible, even though they don't plan to do it themselves. When Harding tells Seafelt that Mac is upstairs getting punished, he and the rest of the patients are quick to deny it, and everyone's asleep when the orderlies drag him back to the ward after his lobotomy. It's unclear if the ward at large ever finds out what really happened to Mac, but when the credits roll, Ratchet and her dominion over the ward have undoubtedly won. McMurphy's revolution impacts Chief more than anyone else in the ward. By watching Mac refuse to take anything lying down, Chief learns how to be as big in his actions as he is in stature, and he feels like he owes that to McMurphy. Without the con man giving him the confidence to talk and break free from the ward's toxic environment, Chief would still be silently sweeping the hospital floors. Chief knows that someone like McMurphy, who is so full of life, would never want to live after being lobotomized. Being a prisoner on Ratchet's ward was hard enough for Mac without being a prisoner in his own body. I gotta get out of here. I can't. Chief understands that feeling better than most, as he lived for years silently taking insults, cut off from socialization, and going through the monotonous motions without feeling like he could be himself. Witnessing McMurphy forced into that type of existence is too much for Chief. After a goodbye hug, Chief makes the choice he believes McMurphy would make for himself by suffocating him with a pillow. The scene is hard to watch as Mac's body involuntarily fights back, but Chief succeeds, and he finally feels like he's done all he can do on the ward, escaping Ratchet's reach. Mac represents freedom and self-empowerment in the ward. While his presence in the film version of the story doesn't have the long-term impact on most patients that he would have liked, his refusal to give up and quest for freedom fuels the plot. There are several ways that Chief can escape the ward, but he picks the most dramatic way possible. Mac would have loved it. When McMurphy tries to pick up the control panel in the tub room earlier in the film, he fails, but he still makes an almost ridiculous effort to move it. While he's red and out of breath from his pointless attempt, he says, But I tried, didn't I? God. At least I did that. In Mac's opinion, no one in the ward ever does anything to help themselves or change their situation. And at this point, he doesn't even have a firm grasp on the risks involved with patients standing up for themselves. Even with his schemes to swindle them out of money, he does care about his fellow patients. 
As one final way to honor his fallen friend, Chief succeeds in ripping the control panel off its stand and chucking it out the window to make his escape. He reaches the freedom Mac strived for while trying something new and succeeding. Even if he failed, Mac would have been proud that he tried. Chief finally felt big, and he acted on it. Ratchet faces no consequences for her actions, including lobotomizing a patient whose crime was lashing out at the woman primarily responsible for the death of his close friend. Ratchet's victory in the ward highlights the stigma that surrounds mental health patients. A larger problem in the mental health industry even today is the failure to listen to and respect the wishes of psychiatric patients. Earlier in the movie, Ratchet makes a pointed threat when McMurphy dares to ask which medicine the orderlies are giving him. But anyone has a right to know what they're putting in their bodies. It's the staff's job to work with patients to determine, as a team, what medicine is helping, if the medication is doing more harm than good, or if the side effects are too much to bear. Instead, she just threatens them if they ask questions about whether the pills are helping or hurting. Ratchet has the entire ward hardwired to do her bidding, and no amount of patient lobotomies or deaths seem to lead to any kind of reckoning for her. Because who are the authorities going to believe? The decorated war nurse or the psych patients? Nurse Ratchet manipulates the ward staff through fear just as much as she plays God with her patients. No one stands up to her, even when they can see that there's something wrong. Ratchet holds all the cards for who gets released and who gets life-altering procedures. Nothing on the ward happens without her say-so. It wasn't until the feminist movement ramped up in the 1960s that the number of working women in the U.S. rose significantly. While many single women were in the workforce in 1930, only about 12% of married women worked. That number rose to about 50% by 1970. After picking up various jobs while men were serving in the military in World War II, married women found purpose in employment, and many fought to keep working after the war ended. Many men weren't thrilled with this and campaigned to keep women in their place as homemakers. Given the stigma, it's not a shock that the film depicts working women in a bad light. Viewers could definitely interpret Ratchet's power-hungry manipulation of the ward as a fear-mongering depiction of all the awful things that can happen when a woman is in charge. Patients frequently accuse Ratchet of taking away their manhood when they rant to each other, a point further driven home by the shot of Ratchet smiling after forcing Mac into a lobotomy. Igas Monez won a Nobel Prize for inventing a procedure that would go on to leave 50,000 patients in the U.S. alone either dead or virtually comatose. In 1949, he modified earlier attempts at brain alteration procedures to create the leucotomy. One year later, Walter Freeman brought the surgery to the U.S., renaming it the lobotomy. The procedure involved what was essentially an ice pick going through the eye to get to the brain instead of drilling through the head. Often touted as a miracle cure, the horrific procedure was supposed to help patients control their emotions. Instead, it left them with virtually no emotions at all. In an interview with Life Science, medical historian and professor Dr. Baron Lerner referred to a lobotomy's after-effect as mental dullness, saying, Most patients could no longer live independently, and they lost their personalities. Lerner praised One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest for its accurate depiction of the procedure, calling it disturbingly real. The novel One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest was published in 1962 during the height of the lobotomy's acceptable use. Walter Freeman performed his last lobotomy in 1967, five years after the film takes place. By its 1975 release, he'd been dead for three years, so why was this story still important to tell? Author Ken Kesey worked as a nurse's aide in a psychiatric ward at a veterans' hospital in 1960, which inspired his novel. That year, Dr. Freeman performed a lobotomy on the youngest patient ever to receive one, a 12-year-old boy named Howard Dully. Dully survived, growing up to become a bus driver. Dully told NPR, If you saw me, you'd never know I'd had a lobotomy, but I've always felt different, wondered if something's missing from my soul. Lobotomies were on the decline by the time Kesey wrote One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest, and were banned in the U.S. by the time the film was released. The message was clear, though. Far too many patients were subjected to life-altering procedures in psychiatric wards with little say in what happened to them. We see it when Ratchet manipulates Billy with details she shouldn't share about his care. We see it when the nurse forces Mac into electroshock therapy and a lobotomy. We see it in the way the hospital staff uses fear of these procedures to control the ward. We see time and time again that the staff cares more about power and dominance than the patient's health. How cruel and ineffective the lobotomy treatment was adds a powerful ending to get readers and viewers to care about mental health and the ramifications of poor treatment. Hospitals still face massive overcrowding. Patients often have to wait days, weeks, or even months for a bed in a ward or even an appointment, even for severe cases of suicidal ideation or conditions like schizophrenia. While the lobotomy has been outlawed in the U.S. for decades, a modern version of the procedure called psychosurgery is still occasionally performed today. Mental health care has come a long way since the 50s, but there's still work to do. If you or someone you know is having suicidal thoughts, please call the National Suicide Prevention Lifeline at 1-800-273-TALK-8255.
or text HOME to the Crisis Text Line at 741-741.